America rums up efforts to prevent the collapse of Israeli-Palestinian talks and to ensure Israel goes through with the Palestinian prisoner release. In Turkey, at least eight people are dead in violent incidents that erupted during local elections thought to determine the political future of Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. United States Secretary of State John Kerry meets Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in an effort to resolve the standoff between the two superpowers. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening. Tense hours in Jerusalem, Ramallah and Washington as discussions take place in order to reach a deal on extending peace negotiations before it's too late. On 24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev has the latest. Crisis mode, collapse, life control. After eight months of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, it's hard to find optimists that will bet on peace arriving to the region anytime soon. The current focus is much more modest, just to keep the two sides talking. The original Saturday night deadline for the fourth and final batch of 26 Palestinian prisoners released is long gone. Israel, Israel backed down on the agreement and their commitment to the release. So far, Israel has freed 78 prisoners out of 104. But now, Jerusalem refuses to release the rest without a Palestinian commitment to extend talks. Alas, the Palestinians refused to do so without the prisoner release. In between, the U.S., anxious to continue talks, is engaging in marathon meetings trying to find creative solutions to break the impasse. And then came a series of reports and leaks regarding the details of a new deal. Israel offered to release 400 additional prisoners chosen by Israel if talks will be extended. But the Palestinians are demanding much more. 1,000 prisoners to be chosen by them, together with the curb on settlement construction and control over parts of the West Bank's Area C. Whether this is a negotiation maneuver or not, Netanyahu's government won't give more so easily. Hardliner ministers have already vowed to block any additional concessions. We have already made some mistakes about that, hoping that this will promote peace. What seems now that uh, it's not only not going to promote peace, but this is going to just boost up some more uh, such demands. No way. Even though it seems both sides aren't that eager to reach a deal, the U.S. is not giving up on Israelis and Palestinians so quickly. In the upcoming hours, it will be revealed whether this deadlock can be broken. Joining me right now live from Ramallah is Dr. Abdullah Abdullah from the Palestinian Legislative Council. Good evening, Mr. Abdullah. So, uh, Mr. Abdullah, President Abbas keep on denying details in the United States Framework Agreement. Can it be because the Palestinians don't see the Americans as a neutral mediator? Well, there are two different stories. The one story is about the Israeli government uh, uh, backing up from releasing the, the rest of the 104 prisoners before Oslo. This agreement was separate from the negotiations. It was against not going to the United Nations organizations during the release of these time of the negotiations. If Israel is going back on this uh, commitment, then how can we trust Israel will agree to the establishment of a Palestinian state? That's one thing. About the negotiations, where can we go with these negotiations when eight months did not produce one inch closer to peacemaking? Israel is trying to bring every time new conditions that make it impossible for peace to be achieved. Israel wanted to prolong its occupation and to prevent the territorially contiguous and vital state of Palestine to be created yes, but Mr. Mr. Abdullah, you're not Mr. Borders. Abdullah, you're not answering my question. Do you think that the United States is a neutral mediator? If the United States cannot make good on its brokering of a, a, agreement for the release of the prisoners, how can we trust it can be an honest broker? So, uh, the United States has to, to defend its credibility. 
to the defend its accountability in being an honest broker. So, Mr. Abdullah, you know, it By seems, it to release seems the today. Remaining uh, 30 prisoners of Oslo. It seems today, Mr. Abdullah, that the talks are in a fragile situation. So if the Israel, if Israel suggests, uh, let's say, a goodwill gesture, why are you denying it? Where is the goodwill? The goodwill gesture is to, to go back on, on its commitment to free the prisoners before Oslo? Is this a good gesture? 400 prisoners Where are goodwill. Where is the good, good gesture when they don't want to negotiate Jerusalem, don't want to negotiate the right of return? These are, these are bad will, not good will. Because on the table, the negotiations, the six permanent status mem uh, issues uh, are to be discussed on the table before we resumed negotiation 30th of uh, oh, uh, July last. Yes. Uh, now Mr. Israel is trying uh, to break uh, these Mr. Abdullah, uh, Mr. Abdullah, uh, issues and to introduce new factors. Mr. Abdullah, Abdullah, thank you very much for this. And uh, right now I'm joined here uh, live in the studio by our uh, diplomatic correspondent, Al Shalev. Good evening. Good evening. You heard uh, Mr. Abdullah, Abdullah, what he said. It seems that uh, the goodwill of Israel is not accepted by the Palestinians, not even uh, the United States as a mediator. What does the Israeli prime minister have to say about this? Well, Netanyahu himself hasn't publicly spoken about the Palestinian prisoner release or the negotiation in weeks. He has been talking about it in closed political forums. For instance, this morning, his weekly cabinet meeting, he was at weekly Likud minister meeting before the cabinet meeting, he was asked about it. So he tells the ministers that the prisoner issue will be resolved within days and, quote, it will be solved or blow up. He also tells them another interesting thing. He tells tells them that Israel won't ad uh, release additional Palestinian prisoners without receiving, quote, something of value in return. What can that mean? Speculations have been running. It might mean uh, the name of the uh, is American Israeli spy, Jonathan Pollard. It's been brought up in recent weeks. It might mean a stronger Palestinian commitment not to go back to international bodies. In any case, there's one thing all sides agree upon this evening, I'm happy to say. These are very crucial hours. And in the upcoming hours, we will probably get the answers to all our questions if there is a deal and what it is. If there is a deal and what it is, what do you think are the chances that the talks will be extended? Well, we've been speaking to Israeli officials today. Israel, Israel really wants to continue talks. Uh, but you, when you talk to the Palestinians and you hear the Palestinian anger over this uh, upcoming prisoner release that hasn't gone, through, gone forward, you're not, it's not, you, you don't find many reasons to be optimistic. Yes, of course. Tal Shalev, thank you very much for this. And uh, to something else, millions of Turks flocked to polling stations across Turkey today to vote in the country's municipal elections. Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan has a central role in the polls, even though his name wasn't on the ballots. I-24 News correspondent Shahal Pellet has the story. In what would normally be regarded as small-town politics, Turkey's local elections have become critical and violent, with eight people killed in clashes between groups backing rival candidates. The elections turned into a referendum on the rule of the Islamist-rooted AK party and Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan, who's battling to ward off graft allegations and stem a stream of damaging security leaks. I am 74 years old and I have never seen any election taking place in such a tense atmosphere and I hope this will be the last one. Over the past few weeks, Erdogan has been campaigning as if his own career was on the line. A loss in the race for the current mayors of Istanbul and Ankara will be a strong indicator of Erdogan's waning influence. However, despite a series of scandals, Twitter bans and YouTube blocks, analysts expect the AK party, which swept to power in 2002, will outstrip the opposition and win the majority of the vote, only to tackle the country's most serious problems. The Turkish Prime Minister should not blame opponents and his critics should heed the opinions of those who vote for the AK party. On Monday morning, the government will face grave problems, such as economical and political ones, and the polarization of seven to eight millions of people is also a critical problem for the government. In 2009, the AKP clinched 39 percent of the vote. Experts believe anything below 40 percent this time around will be considered a blow to Erdogan. The elections will also launch a crucial 15-month voting cycle, including the presidential elections, which Erdogan is thought to be planning for.
In any case, these nationwide municipal elections, marking the first time Turks will vote since last summer's massive anti-government demonstrations, will be an opportunity for the Turkish people to voice their choices. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and his Russian counterpart uh, Sergei Lavrov are meeting in Paris in order to find a solution to the East-West standoff over the Crimea crisis. Before some of the conclusion of the meeting are seen, I-24 News reporter Oni Benbasat explains what led to these essential talks. Over the past weeks, relations between Russia and the United States have been less than warm. The ongoing crisis in Crimea has drawn heavy criticism by the U.S. over what it sees as Russia's illegal seizure of the Ukrainian region. Over the weekend, the exchange of words between President Barack Obama and President Vladimir Putin escalated when Obama insinuated that Russia has intentions to widen the invasion, which Moscow was quick to deny. In order to ease this tense standoff between the two countries, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov are holding a meeting in Paris to try and find a resolution to the dispute. The U.S., together with the European Union, has imposed two rounds of economic sanctions on Russia, hoping to pressure the country to pull its troops back from the Ukrainian border. But Moscow views this move as personal and vengeful, as some of the sanctions include visa bans and asset freezes on some of Putin's closest allies. They try to take those sanctions on a more personal level and present them as directed at certain people personally. It is clearly a desire to take revenge. We can see it with the naked eye. The West has been threatening tougher sanctions targeting Russia's economy should Moscow take further action to destabilize Ukraine. But according to Lavrov, the situation in Crimea is perfectly legal. To say that in Kyiv reality prevailed while this reality in Crimea they cannot accept, it just doesn't withstand criticism from the diplomatic viewpoint. It is simply a dishonest approach. If they are ready to accept that reality in Kyiv, then they should accept this reality in Crimea even more. Although both countries lean towards de-escalating the crisis, it is clear each of them will find it difficult to make concessions, leaving both Kerry and Lavrov with hard work ahead of them. And we are back to Turkey's election. Joining me right now is Dr. Nimrod Goran, chair of Mitvim, the Israeli Institute for uh, Regional Foreign Policies. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, Mr. Goran, what is considered a success to Erdogan, the AK party, to keep the upper hand in these elections? We are looking at both numbers and cities. In terms of the numbers, the AKP itself defined the 42 percent as kind of where success and failure meets. In the last municipal elections, AKP got 39, almost 39 percent of the vote. And we should look whether this number goes up and down. Uh, but maybe more important is whether Erdogan's party is going to keep its control over the key cities in Turkey, especially in Istanbul and in Ankara. Dr. Goran, uh, rumors say that uh, if Erdogan will succeed in these elections, his next move will be to run for president. How strong is the president position in Turkish politics? The president position is not a very powerful one in Turkey. One of Erdogan's ambitions during, his, uh, during this term was to change the, the electoral system or parliamentary system into one that gives more power to the president. However, this has not been done until now, and it seems quite difficult for Erdogan in his current uh, public positioning to go into such a move. Another alternative he may have would be to change his party regulation in order to enable him to go for a fourth term as prime minister. So in other, world, in other words, what, what will be a success for him in these elections? If he doesn't go down uh, from the um, level of support he had in the last municipal elections, uh, if he doesn't kill Istanbul or in Ankara, uh, if no catastrophe happens, because he doesn't have any significant political rival in the party system in Turkey, the main rival that he is facing is one that is based in Pennsylvania, uh, Fethullah Gulen, the spiritual leader that is not in Turkey at all. Uh, so he doesn't face any uh, big time political activities contending him. Uh, Dr. Gore, and thank you very much for this. Thank you.
In Cairo, security pol police opened fire with tear gas and backshot on supporters of the post President Mohamed Morsi, who were demonstrating on the campus of Al Azhar University. The protesters were demanding the reinstatement of students who had been expelled for belonging to Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood organization. The students were also demonstrating against the presidential BD by former army strongman General Abdel Fattah al Sisi and Egypt's electoral commission announced today that the presidential elections will take place on may 26th and 27th and now we want to look inside israel and now joining me is i24 news correspondent elio Holmberg for a look and inside israel hello hello good evening before we will see and talk about uh, your report uh, today the expectations for the final phase of the holy land trial which involves former prime minister ehud Olmert, were crushed when the judge delayed the decision regarding the verdict for another day before we dive into this tangled subject let's see your report the biggest corruption scandal in the history of Israel, a real-life soap opera in the Israeli house of cards, etc., etc., all of those and much more have already been said about former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert's bribery and corruption affairs, forcing him to resign and spend years in court. The Holy Land affair, which was first exposed almost four years ago, alleges that the Holy Land real estate developers paid tenth of millions of dollars to public employees and elected officials to advance its construction project in Jerusalem, including substantially shortening planning times, smoothing over planning objections, rezoning land, extending tax breaks and increasing the size of the permitted construction. It is suspected that businessman Hillel Cherny, one of the owners of the land, bribed a number of state officials between the years 1994 and 2007, including Olmert, at the time, mayor of Jerusalem. On January 5, 2012, Tel Aviv district prosecutors officially charged the former prime minister and 12 others with receiving bribes in the Holy Land affair, but it was just the beginning of a long saga full of Shakespearean twists. During the trial, the turn state's witness, Shmuel Dechner, for years a business advisor of Cherny, passed away only hours after he yet again testified against Olmert. The last bombshell dropped was only a few weeks ago when Olmert's closest ally and longtime bureau chief, Shula Zakian, offered to testify against her former boss in exchange for a LinkedIn plea bargain. The roller coaster affair is now close to an end, leaving a stain on those involved and more importantly, strengthening the sad idea that just like in the disease of corruption in Shakespeare's Hamlet, politics are always mixed with wealth and power. Believe me, Ellie, the screenwriters of the House of Cards need just to spend a year here. Eating their heart now. The Definitely. best script is real life. <laughs> so we were just mentioning uh, the many, many surprises. Here we go again. Another surprise. The story is not yet over. The Tel Aviv court judge decided today not to decide whether the verdict of the Holy Land trial will give, be given tomorrow or not. Now we're facing three options. The first one, the full verdict to all the ones in, involved, including Shula Zakin and Eud Olmert, will be given tomorrow. Option number two, the verdict to all involved, not including Eud Olmert and Shula Zakin, will be given tomorrow. And the last option, the entire verdict will be delayed to an unknown uh, date. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So it all remained very unclear, and this nothing less than a really Shakespearean case is turning another spin. Let's hear what Israelis have to say about that. Let's see. Yes, of course he's corrupt. Everybody is corrupt over there, but he really took it to a new height. I don't know if Ehud Olmert corrupt. It seems like uh, the media already uh, let us know he's corrupt from uh, day one. Something was stinky for there, no doubt. If it's him or somebody else or the contract or the, I don't know, and it doesn't really regard me that much <laughs> in the end. I think there's something like not quite right about like all the new Olmert like uh, investigations, and I think there might be like something wrong there. You know, uh, the court didn't say the final word, but until the court didn't say the final word, he is not corrupted yes, yet. The 
the opportunity that a uh, prime minister will be convicted is uh, an Yeah, and what will happen one. with his politic or political career, God knows. Maybe God has the answers. I don't think that even he has it. Thank you very much for Thank this, uh, Ellie. We're going out for a small break, two minutes break, and then we will be back for the daily question. America rumps up efforts to prevent the collapse of Israeli-Palestinian talks and to ensure Israel goes through with a Palestinian prisoner release. In Turkey, at least eight people are dead in violent incidents that erupted during local elections thought to determine the political future of Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry meets Russian's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in an effort to resolve the standoff between the two superpowers. Yes, and as we've reported, Israeli-Palestinian talks are at a critical point, approaching the planned deadline of April 29th. Before their start, the Palestinian Authority agreed to shelve future plans to seek recognition as a state during nine months of intensive peace talks. But negotiations are faltering, and Abbas is so far refusing to extend them past next month. On today's Daily Question, we ask you, should Abbas press for full Palestinian statehood at the United Nations? Joining me right now is I-24 News editor Nourit Zanger. Good and the results are? The results are, well, so today we wanted to take the other half of the question that we asked our viewers on Thursday. Thursday we spoke about should Israel release prisoners, but there's the other half now should Abbas declare statehood? So 75% said no, Abbas should not go to the UN to declare statehood. Just 21% said yes. Wow. And I have to say that split, of course, doesn't reflect necessarily the pro or anti-Palestinian because there are good arguments that are very pro-Palestinian but against uh, declaring statehood. And uh, I'll just mention actually that yesterday the Palestinian Center for Public Opinion found that 87% of Palestinians support a bid if Israel doesn't release prisoners. So they're pretty clear on how they feel. Yes. <laughs> Let's go to the nose. Let's start with the nose. Let's Simon see. in Haifa says, only if Abbas never wants a Palestinian state to arise. The best way to scuttle any chance of Palestinian statehood is to let the United Nations handle it. Well, I think it's, again, putting like a mediator at the middle and let an them An extra decide. mediator. And yes. it's certainly arguable that the really? UN... Really? Do they uh, need another one? Yeah. And the United Nations <laughs> arguably is not always the most effective international body. Moving it's on. It's an odd statement. <laughs> no, wait. I will not comment. I'm Judd. <laughs> says, before Palestine asks to be recognized, it should handle the division between Hamas in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank. This, again, I think can be read also still as a pro-Palestinian response, but uh, it's a good point. What is a Palestinian state going to be? How, uh, I, how can I, that I, leadership create We asked create a few uh, Palestinian officials about uh, this issue exactly, but, you know, when you're looking inside the Israeli society, you see a lot of divisions over there as this well. This is true. So. This is true. At least there's one government to speak to. Unfortunately, the government says different things. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Lucien Smaja said, recognize what? Are there well-defined borders? No. Then on what basis should its borders be established? Again, it's true, the, some of the criticism here is that uh, even if he declares statehood like he tried to do in 2011, it may just be symbolic. Yeah, you know, you can say, uh, we can say, answer Lucien, that just come for a visit to the West Bank and just have a small tour and you will see, really, you will see the borders uh, exactly where you need to see them. Uh, and uh, one more comment? Let's go to Charles in Ottawa who said, declaring statehood at the UN is like putting a Band-Aid on a massive wound. If Abbas cares about the long-term situation of Palestinians, he shouldn't do it. Yes, and let's see, uh, hear what the Palestinians have to say about that. Joining me uh, to the conversation is senior Fatah official Ahmed Ghanem. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, do you think that um, pushing for a statehood at the United Nations will help to solve the conflict? Sure. I think with the long uh, period of negotiation without uh, any come uh, with the Israeli government, with the several Israeli governments, I think this is the only choice in front of the Palestinian leadership and in front of the Palestinian people. We already uh, had been recognized as a state in the United Nations, but we are waiting to have uh, the full uh, recognition from the uh, United Nations Security Council and to be member, full member in the United Nations. I think this is the next step that we are preparing for. 
But it won't be, let's say, a slap in the face of the United States to do so? Look, we are not against the continuous of the efforts of uh, Mr. Kerry, but uh, we don't want to mislead ourselves and we didn't want to mislead our people. We spent uh, nine months waiting for the res waiting for result, positive result from this process, but uh, we see that uh, we are witnessing that Israel is uh, uh, escaping from the outcome of this uh, process and uh, trying to put into this process by very negative way they ask us to pay the uh, bill twice for the same good for one item pay uh, twice and uh, they are delayed uh, they, um, they are not uh, um, implementing the agreement that had been decided uh, nine months uh, before yes and we have we have to take in our considerations that 55 mr. Palestinians have been killed in during the, this uh, yes mr. Uh, mr. nine months and intense activity had been continued uh, during it and mr. We, have to of course, for mr. This. we will have you again on the show uh, as you know uh, for sure but we want to hear more from our viewers thank you very much for this conversation Nurit. Always a lot to say. That's Always okay. a lot to say. On Let's the go subject. to the yeses. Uh, Tila, Tina said, of course he should. 66 years of displacement, dispossession, and discrimination is 66 years too many. So, of course, a very clear statement. Palestinians should put an end to the occupation, should declare a state. Again, the question is, what? once you say... Yes, we have a state. What uh, you what do happens with it? In reality yes, and we see the reality in the Gaza Strip, and we see what is going on in Gaza. The question is, is if the Palestinians actually can handle a Palestinian state of and their just own. Just today, for now. The, the Israeli Economy Minister Naftali Bennett just today said, "Go ahead, fine. Go. Uh, it's fine do for it. Abbas to go do it. You don't have a you don't have an economy. You don't have defense." Had some harsh statements, uh, uh, yes. saying a harsher version let's of that. Let's hear one more. Um, so uh, let's go to Martin in Denmark. Palestine should push for statehood in the UN. Israel, controversial as it is, did so years ago and is recognized by the world. Why should Palestine be any different? One more before we're Let's go to step one, who says the UN is the only option for Palestine to ever become a state. Peace talks are obviously not the realistic route. Really? So kind of... And we finished with this? <laughs> yes, the UN uh, is the only option? One day I'll finish optimistic, one day pessimistic. When well, it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this time. <laughs> it's probably going to be pessimistic, but I'll do my best next Yeah, week. please do. Please do so. <laughs> no, wait, Zangor, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Sir. And we're going out for a small break, two minutes break, and then we will be back for the news today. We'll culture, sport, um, economy, whatever you want. Just go back two minutes and I'll be back. America rumps up to efforts to prevent the collapse of Israeli-Palestinian talks and to ensure Israel goes through with a Palestinian prisoner release. In Turkey, at least eight people are dead in violent incidents that erupted during local elections thought to determine the political future of Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. And U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry meets Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in an effort to resolve the standoff between the two superpowers. Welcome back again. Israeli Arabs staged a nationwide strike and took to the streets in protest today to mark the 38th land day. While the demonstrations were relatively peaceful, the event is a yearly reminder of the ongoing divisions in the Israeli society. I-24 News military correspondent Charles Babuzer reports. Tensions flared throughout Israel on Sunday as the country's Arab population marked Land Day with a general strike and nationwide protests. The annual event, organized by the Higher Arab Monitoring Committee, commemorates six Israeli Arabs killed by security forces on March 30, 1976, 
during riots prompted by the state appropriation of land in the Galilee. We have come to tell the whole world, especially the state of Israel, which grabbed and invaded, that we will not accept this land not being Palestinian. We will do everything in order to win back this land and expel settlers. Arab shops, schools, medical and other facilities and services were shut down, while the traditional parade took place in the towns of Saknin and Arabe. This year's demonstrations also included protests in the Negev, where Bedouin are upset over government-ordered land evictions and demolitions. Taking place on the backdrop of Israel's delay in releasing a fourth batch of Palestinian prisoners, Sunday's events took on added significance. This is also about the prisoner release and the martyrs. I think they should be freed because a long time has passed and it is enough. While the demonstrations were relatively peaceful, land aid protests have in the past descended into violence. In 2012, one Palestinian man was killed and dozens more injured in widespread fighting with Israeli forces. Land Day is thus an annual reminder of the wide gaps and tensions that continue to exist between Israel's Jewish and some 1.6 million Arab citizens. And uh, United States Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, Dempsey uh, spent a day in Jerusalem meeting with Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Bogielon discussing security in the Middle East and U.S.-Israel ties. Yelon has been in hot water lately after a string of comments criticizing U.S. actions, in particular those of the United States Secretary of State John Kerry. In their meeting today, he seemed to try to smooth it over, praising the American ally and commanding Kerry's effort at reaching a peace deal. And joining me right now is defense and government analyst for Haaretz Daily Newspaper, Amir Oren. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So, you know, after the, let's say, Bogie alone was not that polite, how do you begin the conversation in this uncomfortable situation? You don't uh, have to go into it. Uh, you bring your own formula. And uh, obviously, you coordinate it beforehand. You do it uh, for the media. Uh, and uh, neither General Dempsey it's nor. Like nothing ever happened. Yes, but uh, General Dempsey is the guest of uh, General Benny Gantz, his counterpart. And he has also met with Gantz following his meeting uh, with Yalon. Neither Gantz nor Dempsey are in the policy making level. And uh, they keep to themselves what they think of what Yalon uh, said about Kerry. And obviously, uh, Yalon is still not the favorite of the uh, Obama administration. But uh, Dempsey has a job. And his job here is to prevent Israel from acting rashly. Um, and to look at the challenges, let's say, for uh, towards the year 2020, and what are the military challenges? The year 2020 is what uh, the uh, U.S. defense establishment uh, aims at. They are downsizing. They have budgetary problems. This is to say they are not coordinating an attack on Iran tomorrow or later uh, this year. But um, uh, the uh, very uh, uh, reason Dempsey came over is to prevent Israel from acting uh, a bit uh, haphazardly, because uh, once you know that the chairman is on his way like over, like it gave a clue that uh, right, you, you gave a clue that it, it will act by itself if it needed. Yes, but you know, once the chairman announces that he is coming, you don't do anything if you're Israel. Then once he's in the country, of course you don't do anything. And then in the days following his visit, you can't do anything because it will be perceived as um, uh, a coordinated attack. I mean, so, the, 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 the Americans are really still worried about the fact that Israel might attack Iran? Of course they are, because they read the press. And even though they know that looking at it uh, coolly and rationally uh, could result uh, in no attack, nevertheless, they see Israeli politicians coming out with very strong statements. They know that if the uh, Geneva talks fail, Israel might uh, act unilaterally. So better um, to hold Israel's hand and uh, smooth it over and hope for the best. 
So military-wise, is Israel sending some uh, hints that it wants the United States uh, support in a case of an attack? Israel might uh, send some signals, but uh, they are not well received. Um, we have right now an undergoing uh, American-Israeli-Greek uh, exercise in the Mediterranean called uh, Noble Dinah. That's the extent of uh, American-Israeli military okay. uh, coordination. There will be no coordination for in Iran. For now, of course. For now. Ami Rol, and thank you very much for this. Thank you, Lucy. The Ebola epidemic detected in Guinea is feared to be spreading outside of the country. Neighboring Senegal has been taking measures to prevent further spread, while the EU pledged $690,000 to fight the outbreak. If all 70 deaths associated with the disease are confirmed as Ebola, this would be the deadliest outbreak the world has seen in seven years. I-24 News reporter Ronnie Bembasat has the details. Guinea is still battling to prevent the spread of the deadly Ebola virus. At least 70 people are suspected to have died from the disease in the West African nation. And concern is growing as the virus seems to spread outside of the country. On Saturday, Senegal closed its land border with Guinea in an attempt to contain the epidemic. And according to the World Health Organization, both Sierra Leone and Liberia have reported suspected cases and deaths consisted with the virus in people who recently traveled to Guinea. People travel a lot, so those who are infected come in contact with others. Our biggest problem at the moment is isolating the cases so we can put them all in a specialist treatment unit so they are isolated and can infect other patients. Although most cases so far have been reported in the south of the country, last week eight cases, including one death, were confirmed in the capital, Conakry, where the population density is extremely high. Since this virus was announced in Conakry, really all Guineans have come here every day to buy cleaning products, bleach, disinfectant and things like that. Every day it's like this. The virus is transmitted through contact with contaminated blood, bodily fluids or infected corpses. The mortality rate of the Zaire strain detected in the country stands at 90%. And to this day, there is no known treatment for Ebola, and no vaccine is available. And in the latest from the search for the missing plane, dozens of Chinese relatives of the missing passengers aboard missing flight MH370 arrived in Malaysia on Sunday morning and demanded to meet with state officials and receive proof that their loved one's plane had indeed crashed. The search for the Malaysian airliner intensified with eight ships and ten planes hailing from six countries involved in the operation sweeping a vast expanse of the Indian Ocean off Australia for wreck cage. An Australian ship with special U.S. supplied equipment to uh, help locate the plane's black box flight recorder was dispatched to the search area from the Australian city of Perth. And now we want to see where are the rich people going. Joining me right now to look at economy is I-24 News host Natalie Ehrlich. Good evening. Good evening. So where are the rich people going? <laughs> well, actually, it's really interesting. According to a new report from New World Wealth, the United Kingdom has become the top destination for the world's millionaires. And trailing that is Singapore. It, uh, it got 45,000 millionaires, and uh, trailing that is the U.S., then uh, Australia, and then Hong Kong. So Israel is not even in the list, I understand? No, <laughs> I don't think so Okay. <laughs> at the moment. And uh, one interesting fact that came out of the study is, again, the U.K. has the most inflow of millionaires from across the globe at over 100,000 people that have flocked there over the past decade from 2003 to 2013. Not only do they have the most coming into their country, but also into their top city, London. London, which really surprised me coming from New York City myself. Yeah, but you know, whomever is going to London, you can know and you can feel by the money when it's just like going out of your hands that it's very expensive to be there. So what is, is causing this and why are they moving? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that, you know, some place like Singapore, for example, uh, it, it certainly offers a lot of security 
and also, uh, more importantly, uh, tax shelters, essentially. So you even have people in the U.S., like Eduardo Saverin, who is one of the Facebook founders, he renounced his citizenship, and he's one of a growing uh, number of people in the certain club that are trying to avoid paying uh, taxes on capital gains, uh, and uh, even, go even going as far as renouncing their U.S. citizenship, which is certainly sought after all across the globe. Uh, so, and I will leave you with that one interesting fact that really surprised me, is that China and India are losing the most millionaires, and they're turning to places, uh, Indians are turning to places uh, like the U.S. and the U.K. and China to Hong Kong. So you know what is, uh, it's just, I'm getting to the conclusion that um, maybe I should move from Israel to go and live in London and to start making money in some way. Okay, I don't think that this item was uh, talking about me or you, for example. Thank you very much for Thank this. you. And uh, now, American politics, where major Republican donor Sheldon Edelson flexed his muscles uh, over the weekend, garnering an apology from New Jersey Governor Chris Christie for using the term Occupy Territories to refer to the West Bank. Charles Bublizer has more. It was the apology heard round the world. Chris Christie, New Jersey's outspoken governor and 2016 Republican presidential hopeful, expressing regret to casino mogul and major political donor Sheldon Adelson. The controversy erupted when Christie apparently gaffed when recounting a 2012 trip to Israel in remarks to the Republican Jewish coalition. I took a helicopter ride from the occupied territories across and just felt personally how extraordinary that was to understand the military risk that Israel faces. Christie's use of the term occupied territories raised eyebrows among those assembled, some of whom urged him to refer to the West Bank as disputed territory. According to the U.S.'s Politico, Christie later met privately with Adelson to offer an explanation and apology, which was reportedly accepted. Adelson, a confidant of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is one of the most powerful figures in American politics by virtue of his massive contributions to Republican candidates. His hawkish positions on Middle East issues are well known. Limit on and to France, uh, France's ruling socialist party is bracing for a setback in local elections today and for a breakthrough of the far right. Results are expected in the coming hours with signs already of a record low through. It's the first nationwide electoral test for the government since Francois Hollande was elected president in 2012. One of the most controversial lessons in the history of the education system took place in an American high school back in the 1960s when a young teacher showed his students how easy it was to become a fascist society. Half a century later, the teacher, Ron Jones, tells our I-24 News correspondent Shahal Pellet how his wave experiment spun out of control. <laughs> In 1967, a teacher in California wrote three words on a blackboard, strength through discipline. He began a historical experiment later known as the wave, its aftermath still taught in classrooms across the world. A student asked the question, how could the Germans behave as they did after the war, claiming it didn't exist? That happened to us. The experiment took on a life of its own, with the students swiftly and unconsciously creating a fascist environment. Portrayed over the years in films, books, graphic novels, plays and even a musical, the experiment shows how easy it is to be seduced by the same social forces which led to the horrors of Nazi Germany. Almost 50 years have passed and Ron Jones, then a 25-year-old high school teacher, is not proud of his educational legacy. I'm ashamed. I, I... I betrayed myself, I betrayed my students, I placed them in danger. We dropped into a place of great darkness, all of us, the students and myself. We'd given up our freedom for the thought of being superior to others. It was a terrible feeling and it, it haunts us today. Jones admits that he didn't realize the experiment would get out of control. The first day was planned, but the subsequent days were all improvisation. It was almost like a jazz musician interacting with the students. Each day had its own momentum and its own excitement. Membership cards, a salute, 
it was electric. Not before the second day, when one student decided to assume the role of Joan's bodyguard, did he realize the power of the exercise, which managed to captivate even him. Well, the problem was that I liked it. I, I liked the power and the order and the discipline. But my wife began to realize quickly that I was obsessed by it. And that was such a thunderous thing to hear that I tried to bring it to an end. And indeed, he ended the experiment by shocking the students. In a rally, he revealed that their leader was none other than Adolf Hitler. Two years later, he was fired from the high school for his involvement in anti-war and civil rights activities. After a decade of silence, he bumped into a former student who gave him the notorious wave salute. It was then that Jones went home and wrote his story for the very first time. For 10 years, we, we existed in denial we covered ourselves up and went into other pursuits to not think about what we had done and who we'd become. Ten years. These days, the American Embassy in Israel and Orna Porat Theatre for Children and Youth have teamed up to bring Jones to Israel, who is intrigued to see the local interpretation of his story. It has importance not because of the Holocaust, but I think it has importance because it brings up the question, when do you again stand up for injustice, inequality, when do you fight for freedom? So hard to do in this, in this turmoil of our times. Stepping into his shoes is Israeli actor and musician Eyal Shechter, who has portrayed the teacher's character for over three years, but now, for the first time, is doing it with the real teacher in the audience. I'm excited. I'm a bit nervous. I'm thinking what he, what he, would, he would think about, uh, about the role that I'm playing, about himself watching it. Jones, who has become a writer and storyteller in the past 30 years, continues to tour the world with his story, spreading his message that history of injustice and inequality must never repeat itself. Now to a place that I'll probably won't visit anytime soon in an effort to boost tourism in its Punjab desert region, Pakistan, last month hosted its annual Cholistan Jeep Rally in which 90 drivers took part in the grueling 400 kilometers long off-road endurance race. Three, two, one. <laughs> Engines roar in the middle of the Cholistan Desert to the south of Pakistan's Punjab province. These rally drivers have to contend with 220 kilometers of sand, watched by tens of thousands of spectators from all over the country. For local people, it's a great event. People come from far away. I hope this place becomes known not only in Pakistan, but also across the world. This rally is a very good thing. We can see this kind of jeep rally abroad, like in Dubai in France. So that's why it should happen in our country too. We're very happy. This is a great thing for us. The race is trying to establish itself on the world scene, like those held in the Gulf states. For now, though, the organization of the rally isn't quite at the right level to attract international drivers. But for the locals, the three-day event is a great show for the outside world. It's really good to come here, seeing a, it's a positive view also for Pakistan because the rest of the things that are going on are all negative. So it's good to have something positive around. The Cholistan Desert is normally a silent expanse of sand, watched over by a fort several hundreds of years old. There are fewer than 10 people per square kilometre, and locals live by rearing animals. But when the rally rolls through, the quiet pace of life changes. When the tourists come, they spend, they live somewhere, they buy food, somewhere, they, they get food from somewhere, even they, they get the petrol and the, the gas from somewhere. And then they, these people, they provide them local guide services. So by and large, there, there's a lot of economic activity generated by this event. After the rally, when the dust settles, silence falls once again on the desert. That is, until the 10th edition next year, which is already in the works. Now let's go out for a run. <laughs> Of course, the sports host of the I-24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Regev. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, Lucy. How are you? Very good. Yourself? So I'm not going out for a run, but you're going out for a construction um, site? Yeah, and uh, you know, it seems like the problems in Brazil, they just don't 
the, the, the don't stop happening and they probably won't stop until the World Cup begins. But another construction worker died um, this weekend yes. in, in Sao Paulo, in the Sao Paulo Stadium. This stadium is a place where the opening game will be played on June the 12th. It has to be ready. You cannot bear those problems anymore. And it, seem, it, it keeps on going. It's just around the corner. It is. And the stadiums are not ready. That's why construction workers keep dying. It's the seventh construction worker to die in the past year. And, and it seems to be a problem now. Yes, the, world, the, the stadiums will be ready. The World Cup will be run. There will be logistics problem. And everything eventually will be fine. But it casts an, a, a real big shadow over Brazil's ability. And the the not, fact that uh, it's two, two and a half months away and these things still happen. Yes, definitely. And it's not the, let's say, um, the good thing to show before no, the games No, absolutely begin. not. Absolutely not. Uh, and uh, just uh, in half an hour, there is a big match. Last week we were speaking here about the, about the Classico of football. Today we'll speak about the Classico of tennis in a half hour at the final. Look at the smile that oh, you have on yes, your face. Oh, yes, yes. Bring me those Classicos. I love yeah. them. <laughs> Novak Djokovic against Rafael Nadal. It cannot get any bigger than this in the world of tennis. They will face each other in the final of the Miami Masters. Nothing surprising about this. What is surprising? Both of them did not play their semifinals. Both of them. How did that happen? Right. Both players who had to face them in the semifinals retired due to injury. Uh, Rafael Nadal's uh, opponent was uh, Thomas Berdich from, from uh, um, the Czech Republic. He retired due to injury. Uh, Novak Djokovic was supposed to play against Kei Nishikori from Japan. A big surprise. He beat uh, uh, Roger Federer in the quarters. But he also got injured, so both it's it's un, unheard of that both both play both players advance to the finals without playing their semis. Absolutely amazing. You know, I'm always amazed by the way that you remember all these names because my I, head I, is full of unimportant I know, details. I know, full I of know, it. No, unimportant names maybe. <laughs> uh, they are important. <laughs> They're the most important names in the world. No, I didn't say anything about Djokovic. Kei Nishikori, remember that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, to something that I'm really personally very good at, you have 30 seconds about Formula One. Formula One, second race of the season um, um, uh, today in Malaysia. Not as dramatic as the one we've previously seen in Australia, but uh, Lewis Hamilton won the race. Nico Rosberg came in second. He was first in Australia, remember? And finally, Sebastian and Fettel, he was on the podium again. He came third, but after two races, Fettel, the world champion, is only seventh in the overall rankings. Yes, there's still a lot of time to go in this in, in this year. The final race is in November, but very interesting indeed. You are the world champion just by yes, saying am, yes. something in 30 seconds. World champion, I love that. <laughs> in anything. Bye-bye that. Jonathan, thank you very much for this. Thank We're you, going Lucy. out for a small break. And then the daily debate. Don't go anywhere. It's going to be hot in the studio, really.